Welcome to all of you uh, this evening. Uh, this is uh, the topic this evening, Decisions at the End of Life, uh, is a particularly lively and relevant one in Canadian society today. We have a traumatic case that uh, was decided in, in favor of uh, Gloria Taylor and Lee Carter in British Columbia, the trial judge said to Gloria Taylor, who, who has ALS, who had ALS, she, she's since died, that she was entitled to assistance in ending her own life. The British Columbia Court of Appeal just recently overturned that decision, not, not because they said it was wrong, but because they said uh, that they were bound by the Supreme Court decision in the Sue Rodriguez case 20 years ago, another British Columbia ALS patient. And, and so if the decision, if the ruling's going to be changed, it's got to be changed by the Supreme Court itself, and, and there will be almost certainly an appeal to the Supreme Court. So that case will be coming to trial. And meanwhile, from out east, as probably all of you know, the province of Quebec has passed legislation. The criminal code in Canada is, as some of, but maybe possibly not all of you will know, the criminal code in Canada is, uh, is federal. No. In the states, it's, each state has its own differing criminal code. And uh, assisted suicide, <clears throat> whether by a doctor or a loved one or a friend, is therefore a criminal offense punishable by up to 14 years in prison in every province in Canada. But health care is a provincial responsibility, and the government of Quebec can't change the criminal code, but what they can do is they can say that... Uh, uh, hastening the death of a patient at that patient's request, uh, subject to various safeguards, uh, is part of health care and therefore part of our provincial responsibility. And they can instruct uh, the uh, Crown prosecutors to exercise the discretion not to bring charges. Now, they will pass this legislation very soon and it too will be challenged. So the Supreme Court's going to get at least two kicks at the cat. Uh, perhaps I should say kicks at the can. Uh, on this issue. And meanwhile, I think aside from legal issues, there there's a lot of concern, a lot of discussion that over the dinner table with an aging population. Many people have quite strong views. And uh, so it's a very live issue in Canada today. Not just physician-assisted suicide or, or mercy killing, but also terminal sedation and withholding and withdrawal of medical care and uh, palliative care. And we've had a Royal Commission report, just for you, the Royal Society of Canada, uh, sorry, has just recently come out in favor of legalizing uh, physician-assisted suicide and uh, mercy killing in Canada, subject to careful restrictions and safeguards and regulations. So, that's our topic tonight, uh, the whole range of uh, end-of-life options. Uh, we have uh, three distinguished guests, uh, all from uh, the University of Manitoba, though in the case of Peter Marcus, then it was a few years ago uh, that he was a professor of uh, pathology and forensic pathology at the, at the U of M. Uh, my other two colleagues uh, are currently uh, academics at the University of Manitoba, and I'll, I'll introduce each of them in turn. Uh, each has agreed to uh, speak for about eight to ten minutes in their initial presentation. If they go over, a trap door will open and they'll be swallowed up into the basement, uh, never to be seen or heard again. Uh, so we'll take about 30 minutes for, for you to get three different perspectives. The perspective of a, of a physician, the perspective of a farina gerontologist, was that? <laughs> and uh, and Mary immediately to my left is uh, is is a lawyer who specializes in uh, biomedical law. I'm not going to give uh, extensive. Indeed, I'm not going to really give any introduction because you've got their biographies in front of you, and I'm presuming that we're all literate. So uh, uh, I'm going to uh, ask each of them in turn. And uh, Farina. <laughs> I'm so anxious about pronouncing her first name. Uh, and I was a little bit anxious about her last name too. Manic. How, how am I doing? Do I get a B plus? Yeah, yeah. B plus. <laughs> hey, I, I was worried about a D or an F. <laughs> uh, Farina will, will, uh, will speak first. And uh, uh, perhaps I might just begin by asking you, uh, 
Canadian public opinion for for about f at least 15 years has, has been very solidly in favor of law reform. And uh, what do you think? Uh, is is it time for a change? Is reform in the air? I've I've given. Uh, dozens of lectures to senior citizens, and I've never had an, an old person, one may say old person, I've never had anyone express anxiety that they'll be bumped off too soon. But lots have expressed anxiety uh, that it would be a curse to live too long, and that they might not, that they might die very badly. Uh, what do you hear? Would you like to hear more? Am I, am I on? Yeah, okay. Um, in terms of the polls, I guess it varies actually a lot in terms of what uh, what people say about about assisted suicide. It, it ranges. You look at the literature anywhere from as low as thirty percent to eighty percent, right? So it really depends on who you ask, and I think that's what you're getting at. It depends on who you ask, and the the the, the dialogue can get extremely. Uh, diverse depending on religious backgrounds and I'm sure you've experienced that there's personal perspectives there's age perspectives so so depending on who you ask makes a big difference so what do people believe well it kind of depends on who you ask and it also depends on when you ask people are they closer towards death or further away from death so I don't think it's quite as simple as that so Okay, now I can go into my thing. Okay. You've already started. I've started, <laughs> yes, yes, I have. Uh, but uh, like Arthur said, I, I'm, uh, I'm in aging, so my perspective to this comes from an, from an aging perspective. So, so you can look at it from ethical issues and legal issues and disability perspectives and many different perspectives. And I come from aging. Just to set the stage then, and again, Arthur already alluded to that. He's basically already said everything in his intro, but we have an aging population, and I'm sure you're aware of that, and when you look at the numbers, the number of seniors in Canada will go from 5 million currently up to 10 million in about less than 15 years, and that's because of the baby boomers. And as the baby boomers are aging, and as the baby boomers, and that's a very large group of people born between 1946 and 64, as they are aging, as their parents are aging, as they see their parents die, they will, I think, make changes happen. They are always have, they've always had an impact. Whenever they've had, whenever that group has come through society, they have changed what we do. So I'm expecting that the dialogue around aging and assisted suicide is absolutely not going to go away, it's gonna get stronger. So that's the context in terms of an aging perspective. Um, I didn't want to make three points until uh, Arthur sh cuts me off here. So the first point I wanted to make is that from an aging field um, perspective, uh, the concern has been raised that there may be some societal pressures for people not to want to be a burden. Um, when you ask seniors, a lot of them are very much afraid of losing independence, of being a burden on their family, on society. And when you look at societal perspectives, you see actually quite a lot of negativity against older adults. You see it reflected in the media in terms of presentations of uh, that older cohort as the, the great tsunami, the apocalyptic demography, these vivid terms that are really quite negative. Um, so the idea being that this, this ageism that is, is in our society might actually force pressure, and this would be unconsciously, not so much consciously, but unconsciously, uh, pressure people into wanting to end their lives or maybe families into uh, making decisions on their behalf. So that's a concern that has been raised. Um, I think the ageism concern is legitimate. It's very, I think we need to address it, tackle it. However, I still think we need to talk about assisted suicide. We can't just say, well, there's ageism. Let's just direct the discussion towards that issue now and away from assisted suicide, euthanasia, end of life issues. The second point I wanted to make is that sometimes the discussion around dying gets redirected into healthcare issues. So the argument goes that 
if only we had better health care at the end of life, then people would not want to or would not need to ask for assisted suicide or euthanasia. So again, I, I understand that argument. I think we have a long ways to go in terms of end-of-life health care. There's a lot being done in terms of palliative, and that's very positive. Still, we have a ways to go from that perspective. And as in the ageism argument, I think we still need to be careful in, in saying, yes, we need to work on improving health care, but at the same time, we still need to talk about, about the right to die. So one does not divert us from the other argument. And I think the, uh, the example of recently of uh, Dr. Daniel Lowe, who made a video before he died, is a very good example. So the, the media he was presented as the SARS doctor. He uh, quite clearly said he had excellent palliative care. He was very well cared for, yet he still asked or felt that he could have benefited from assisted suicide. So the healthcare argument is out there, and I think we need to focus on it, but not entirely take away from the argument of assisted suicide, euthanasia, whatever you want to talk about. So my third point I want to make is, is a really broader one. And I think in our society, we're remarkably reluctant to talk about dying in general. Uh, death has been uh, medicalized, it's been marginalized, it's not something that happens within a family and a home anymore. There's a trend towards that again with palliative care, but still it is very much still disease-oriented. And we're a society, and from a research perspective, we want to get rid of diseases, right? We want to eliminate all the diseases. When you look at the top causes of death, cancer, heart disease, we're very hard trying to find cures for them. We don't want to die of those things. We don't want to die of diabetes. We don't want to die of stroke. And that's all good. But ultimately, we have to die of something. And I think we lose sight of that. And we lose sight of the fact that before the, for death, there will be a decline. Sometimes it's short, but very few people will be very, very healthy, and then one day they will go to bed and simply not wake up. So that decline will happen, and we need to recognize it, and sometimes the decline can be severe, it can be prolonged. And it can involve dementia. How many of you in this room have been affected by dementia, have had somebody, family, who's had dementia? Right, lots of hands. <coughs> There's a slow progressive decline, not being able to get out of bed, not being able to eat, not being able to communicate, talk, recognize family. So my point is, we need to talk about dying Assisted suicide, euthanasia is part of that dialogue, but it's broader than that. It has to do with advanced uh, care directives, wills, dealing with family issues before we get to that final point when maybe it's really <coughs> we're, we're at the very end. So, so my three points are really, the point is we need to talk about dying, and part of dying is we need to talk about assisted suicide, euthanasia. I was too short, right? You've got, you've got a second cookie <laughs> coming in on your time. Well, I noticed there are cookies and I think coffee for, for the reception period after. Our second speaker uh, will be Mary Sharif, uh, as I mentioned her. Did I say her? Yes. <laughs> uh, as I mentioned earlier, Mary teaches, amongst other things, uh, uh, biomedical law at, in our faculty of law at the University of Manitoba. Mary, I'd like to start by not necessarily posing a question, but just putting it to you that um, physician-assisted suicide, assisted suicide is a crime in Canada today, but um, Peter and I were chatting earlier, I don't know of a single doctor in Canada who's ever spent one, even one day in jail for hastening the death of a patient. Although all of us know that it happens, maybe not every day, but quite frequently. And indeed, of the people who've been charged with uh, mercy killing and, and physician assisted suicide, probably fewer than a single handful has ever spent a day in jail. They're 
they're either downcharged to administering a noxious substance and they're either the jury acquits even though the evidence is strongly in favor of conviction it kind of looks as if the reality on the ground de facto you you uh, you aren't likely to experience the teeth of the law biting into your rear end <clears throat> unless you're one of the unlucky very few who who where discretion is exercised to charge you, to charge you with a serious crime, and then a jury or a judge decides to convict you and send you to jail rather than giving you a conditional sentence or a uh, suspended sentence or, or something like that. So we're all waiting in, uh, with interest to see what the Supreme Court does, but it kind of looks as if society and its values have marched ahead and have almost made the decision for us because the doctor who assisted Sue Rodriguez to die was never charged, never mind convicted or, or sent to prison. What do you think? Well, uh, what do I think? I think that, I don't know that it's uh, an issue of society marching ahead. I think that that's probably always existed to a certain extent. Um, so what we need is, is more research, more discussion, more robust discussion, more transparency. Um, with respect to what people are doing and the decisions people are making. Um, so I don't know that it's a change. I think that it's probably always been around, um, based on what I've looked at anyway. Good. All right, so um, some of the research, um, well, first of all, I've been looking at the uh, assisted death issue through a legal lens for approximately six years. And um, some of the research that I've been uh, doing has been looking very closely at the different laws in different jurisdictions that have legalized assisted death um, and in particular I've been looking uh, for answers to the following questions how are these laws the same sorry how are these laws different what's the scope and reach of these laws and if the scope and reach of these laws are different why is that the case and I wanted to look at these uh, questions in great detail um, because in discussions and debate about legalization of assisted death, we frequently hear and use the term dying with dignity. So I wonder what does dying with dignity actually mean from a legal perspective? So in other words, I wanted to know how this concept of dying with dignity and the concept of dignity, how that was being translated by law. and what does it technically mean then at the end of the legal day? So does dignity mean simply autonomy and the right to choose or does it mean something else? And if it only means autonomy, then this is a very powerful concept and legally then how could the law, if it only means autonomy, how can the law then properly restrain the practice of uh, assisted death and keep it within a very narrow scope? So anecdotally, I knew that uh, dying with dignity couldn't possibly have only one definition, uh, legally speaking, because the handful of jurisdictions that have actually passed assisted uh, death legislation um, do vary, and there are differences in scope. So why is that the case? Why is it the case if all of these laws are premised on dying with dignity? Why would these laws be different? So tonight I want to share with you some of the uh, things that I've learned about the assisted death laws that I've looked at in the jurisdictions that have passed express uh, assisted death legislation. And then I want to talk a, a little bit about how what's going on there. Well, thanks. Thank you. I feel like this thing is like right in my nose, but that's okay. It's a refreshment time. Um, so I want to uh, share some of these ideas and sort of explain then what, um, what's going on in these other jurisdictions a little bit and talk about how what's going on in those jurisdictions and how that impacts or how that connects to what's going on here in Canada. Okay. So for uh, what I'm going to talk about now, I'm going to use two definitions. First of all, I'll talk about euthanasia. And for tonight's purposes, euthanasia would mean lethal injection by a physician at the request of a voluntary and a competent patient. Uh, assisted suicide uh, would be the prescribing of lethal medication to a patient at the patient's request. Uh, the patient is competent and voluntary, again, but the patient would self-administer 
illegal medication, okay? So the first category of assisted death legislation is legislation that permits both euthanasia, so lethal injection, and assisted suicide, so self-administration, for patients who have unbearable suffering with no reasonable solution to cure that suffering. This is a model of assisted death that we see in the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg. So I call this the Benelux model, okay? Now a couple of points here. While euthanasia and assisted suicide are both permitted in those jurisdictions, euthanasia is the more common practice and it is actually the preferred practice, euthanasia, lethal injection. Secondly, with respect to suffering, while irremediable suffering must connect to a recognized medical disease or disorder, suffering can either be physical or non-physical. So that means it could include psychological, but again, it has to be connected to a medical condition, a medical disorder. Okay, so that's the model that's present. There's some variations, but present in Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg. And those jurisdictions are very close together geographically. Okay, they're in a very small geographic space. Um, now, all of these three pieces of law were passed through uh, the respective legislatures in those jurisdictions. <laughs> but it's worth noting that Netherlands was the first uh, jurisdiction to pass the legislation. And the Netherlands had a lengthy history in the practice of euthanasia for patients who were suffering from a, a medical condition. Um, now that practice did not evolve or is not grounded or originally was not grounded on autonomy. It was actually grounded on the concept of a physician conflict of duties. So the two duties that the physician had that came into conflict in order to sort of develop this concept of euthanasia, and Arthur's listened carefully, is the uh, duty to protect life and the duty to relieve suffering. And physicians found themselves in certain circumstances with certain patients that their, uh, their duty to protect life could come into conflict with the duty to relieve suffering because the protecting of life too far was actually increasing suffering of the patients. So physicians found themselves in the position of necessity. Now I'm, uh, this is basically the, the legal construction, okay? So in the position of necessity, then the physician had to make a choice. And so the choice then could be euthanasia to relieve the suffering of the patient. Um, so although these laws in these three jurisdictions are actually structurally very similar, allowing euthanasia or assisted suicide for the suffering patient, they, they, they have been developed differently. The Dutch law again attaches to this necessity thing um, whereas the Belgium and Luxembourg laws then developed, created a very similar law to the Netherlands, um, but developed primarily on the basis of the right to choose and autonomy. So this is why we see the, a tighter connection between a medical condition in the uh, Netherlands experience and the Dutch experience than we do, say, for example, in the Belgium experience, which, which is what we've been seeing in the news lately. We see, we've seen in the news where in Belgium, we've seen euthanasia for uh, deaf, uh, two brothers who were deaf who had a progressive and degenerative uh, disease and they were going to be going blind, so they were given euthanasia. And we've also, at the request of course, and we've also seen the case of, I think it's Nancy Verhelst, uh, who received euthanasia for psychological suffering after uh, botched uh, sex change operations. So the laws are the same, but they have same doctor for both. Uh, laws are similar, but we see a little bit more of an expansion of the scope of the law within Belgium. And I think that relates to how the laws actually emerged. Almost done. So, now let's compare this to the United States. Three states of Oregon, uh, Washington and Vermont, passed legislation in 1997, 2008, and 2013 this year, respectively, so Vermont is this year. The dying with dignity legislation in the United States is almost identical, but it only permits assisted suicide for uh, patients who have been died, uh, who have a prognosis of less than six months to live, six months or less to live. 
okay? And they have to self-administer the medication, so it's only assisted suicide for six months or less to live. Now, a key difference, again, between these states is how the legislation came into being. The two states, Oregon and Washington, passed legislation by ballot initiative. I'll explain about that in a minute. Whereas Vermont actually passed the legislation through its legislature. This is interesting because two of the major criticisms of the American laws uh, by proponents of assisted death are firstly that if the American laws only allow assisted suicide, not euthanasia, it means that assisted suicide is not available to people who may be suffering equally but who are not able to self-administer the medication. Secondly, uh, assisted suicide under the American regime then would be unavailable to persons who might also be suffering equally but, but who don't have that diagnosis of six months or less to live. So those criticisms are, are uh, advanced against the American uh, legislation. Now, a ballot initiative, which is how uh, the legislation was passed in Oregon and Washington, um, is a vote by the people. And that can pretty much avoid having to respond to those inconsistencies or conflicting messages in the legislation. But a legislative debate really cannot do that. It has to tackle them. So although Vermont legislation proceeded um, through the legislature with the same assisted suicide model, basically, as Oregon and Washington, you can see how such a model, a narrow model, assisted suicide for someone six months or less to live, is going to be vulnerable to equality rights arguments, for example. Right. Right. Exactly right. That's exactly right. Good point. So, this is why when we get into the Canadian court debate, right, and the dialogue, um, or for that matter, even the Quebec legislation and the discussion in the Quebec National Assembly, that we see not the emergence of an American type system, the assisted suicide system for six months or less to live, we see the emergence of uh, a dialogue around a Benelux type system, euthanasia, plus maybe assisted suicide, um, for people who are suffering, suffering, the suffering cannot be cured, but it's for a wide, potentially a wider scope than somebody who's at the very terminal stages of end of life, that six month time frame. Um, now, at the same time though, Canada is arguably, and the argument has been made, is more culturally similar though to the United States. Um, so, this has, uh, the United States has been described then when they've proceeded in those three states with assisted suicide as uh, described as a do-it-yourself kind of culture, or a consumerist culture. Um, so assisted suicide is a better fit, if you'll pardon that language, or excuse me for using that language, uh, with Americans than say euthanasia. So based on um, um, what is currently being discussed in Canada, that narrower model, if it were to be implemented in Canada, would immediately then see uh, discussion and debate and constitutional challenges based on equality rights and things of that nature. Um, so that is why we're seeing then in the case, in the Quebec legislature, that much broader Benelux model. But we have to think about culturally, what is it that Canadians actually want? And so what has to happen here is a much broader, deeper discussion and more information and more understanding about what it is that's happening, happening legally in all these other jurisdictions. And not glossing over the differences, but actually looking very carefully at the, dis the differences. Um, and I think that's basically all I wanted to say. Mary also gets a second cookie for staying within time. Okay, good. Peter, they've set a great example for you. I, we, we've heard, we heard initially from Farina, a, uh, I suppose a social science, gerontological perspective. Mary, uh, as a professor of law, has given us a, helpful overview of, uh, of legislation in, in America as contrasted with the Benelux countries. Peter Markestein was for almost 20 years the chief medical officer of the province of Manitoba. So he's a uh, part of his concern is medical but part is legal, uh, forensic. And I'm not sure whether this, whether Peter would accept this as a fair way of describing He's part of his role, but when a physician uh, and a patient figure out that the patient, 
let's say, has ALS and wants to die, is ready to die now. And when they figure out a way to hasten that death and minimize the suffering, the job of the forensic pathologist is to come along and blow the whistle on them and make sure that they get into, at least the doctor gets into legal trouble. I, I mention this because of Peter, some years ago, was, was involved in a very dramatic case uh, in which he, as chief medical officer, called a coroner's inquest, and the doctor who was in effect put on trial, though didn't actually go to court, was his boss at the medical school. <laughs> drama, high drama. Peter, what do you say? Are you, are you the heavy of the story? The, uh, <laughs> wearing the black hat or the white hat? That's right. Well, uh, one thing that's very important in legal medicine is that I did have a job and my personal opinions and personal welfare are not re relevant to the issues of the day-to-day -day work. And it was, the, it is, the job of a coroner, if you like, or a medical examiner, as we call it here, to determine the cause and manner of death, all death that occur, and especially those that are under the act. Now, when I came to Canada from one of the Benelux uh, uh, countries, we were once one country actually, we gave independence to Belgium about 150 years ago from the Netherlands. However, I came to Canada and uh, I was an intern uh, in one of the provinces in actually in, in Newfoundland and uh, a lady uh, came in with a note and uh, that she was going to commit uh, suicide. She was uh, unconscious, so I, I, I examined her and I wrote on the chart, attempted suicide, please admit, right? Well, about half an hour later, the big chief came down and said, who is this idiot who writes down attempted suicide? I said, I did. He said, you cannot do that. I said, why not? He said, that's a crime. I said, you're kidding. What's the penalty? Execution? No. <laughs> he said, you cannot, now we have to call the cops. Maybe we should say that attempted suicide was a crime until 1974. That's right. That's so this is before 1974. Oh, yes, I, I'm, I'm dead old. It's not yes. a crime. <laughs> it's not a crime now. I want Anymore. To sure. It was then. It is, I'm talking about the early 60s. Anyway, uh, so I was told, oh, you call it a cry for help. That's all you need to do. Right? From now on, this called a cry for help. So anybody. So that's the story. Now, then I came here as the, uh, the chief uh, uh, medical examiner and it was my job to certify death as regarding to the cause of death and the manner. You say, what, is, what does that matter? Well, it does. The manner, are, there are five. That's a natural, an accident, a suicide, a homicide, or we cannot determine. It's the natural. Now, in Manitoba, I declared a suicide is the intentional termination of one's life. Okay, now where do I get that from? I do have the legal right, no, but it doesn't matter, because nobody else defines it, so I define it. It is therefore the termination of one's life, not the taking. You see, there's a difference here. If you take your own life, you have to do it yourself. In my opinion, that's irrelevant. I'm from a Dutch culture, that's irrelevant. Suradrikus was not able to take the pills. But in the coroner's inquest that was called, it says she was able to swallow herself, therefore she did it herself. The fact that the physician put the pills in her mouth was not relevant because she could swallow. And she had a choice and she chose to swallow. She need not have done that. This is becoming uh, a bit legalistic in, in a negative sense. So we don't go there. We try to determine if a person is, when they die, whether they die as a result of a suicide or not, an assisted suicide or not. Now, we have very few cases in this province of assisted suicide, but I did come across one uh, where, in my opinion, uh, I rule it as an assisted suicide. A patient suffering from ALS in one of the hospitals wished to die at a certain time, at a certain place, 
and surrounded by people of his choice. That is, in my opinion, the intentional termination of one's life. So I classified that death as an assisted suicide. There was a complaint of euthanasia. However, the problem was death with dignity. My concern was not at all whether this person committed suicide, was assisted suicide. It was the death with dignity. It's all part of the public record. The nurses were told, if you speak of this, you will be fired. So the man, the relatives were told, don't talk to anybody. So here is a man who, who courageously, in my opinion, courageously decided to, to take his life, to terminate his life. And his family was in a, under a cloud of, you know, there's something not right here, you better shut up about it. That was actually one of the reasons why I called this uh, inquest. The judge ruled it natural causes. Yeah. And he said he would have died anyway, just a bit earlier, but he would have died anyway. A, a, a judgment, that's the problem of a medical examiner system when we have judges making medical decisions. Uh, they don't always get it right, in our opinion. They think we don't get it right either, in their opinion. But however, uh, that was the verdict of, of the day. There are consequences uh, of uh, this classification of an assisted suicide or not. It's a crime, and I'm a medical legal person. There's a, a physician involved. That means that that person has to decide whether they're going to take part in this or not. Right? And they have the right in this province and elsewhere not to or to do. I am concerned and I expressed that at the inquest. I'm concerned of the lack of documentation. There's no case. You know, we have no, I go through the charts. We do 8,000 deaths, uh, we investigate 8,000 deaths a year in this province. I was here for 20 years. Now, come on, right? only one case? What is this? Right? Well, it's not documented. So I suggested to the judge there should be regulation to document, and the college picked that up. So there is a requirement of the physician and the caregivers to indeed document. Because without documentation, we will have no data, we have no comparison, we don't know what's going, going on. And, and I, I think that is uh, to our uh, that, uh, that, uh, detriment. Uh, I like the, 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 the quote here, and I'm, and I'm quiet about the defense of necessity. That's a Dutch term, actually. It's translated from force majeure. Napoleon passed through and, and introduced that, that concept in Dutch law. I tried it here with a parking ticket, and uh, 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 the Crown heard about it, and, and he stayed the charges. He said, we don't have the time. Anyway, uh, the defense of necessity uh, uh, is indeed in, 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 in carries a lot of weight in the Netherlands. My experience in the Netherlands are my best friend died of ALS, euthanization. He died a euthanized. He had a wine and cheese party. I'm not kidding. But all his friends were there. And as much as he was able, he shook their hands, he went upstairs, and he died. My mother, my foster mother, was euthanized. She had an agreement. And it was amazing. She was she could not swallow. She had a stroke. She was 94. And uh, the doctor came in, and I said, you know, she's not getting any fluid here. Nothing. She said nothing. He said no, because we don't keep them alive, right? But what did he do? He woke her up, and he said, Mia, do you remember that we had an agreement that if I couldn't help you anymore, right, I you would not want me to do what I, or ask me to do anything, I cannot help you. Do you wish to die or do you wish to be treated? Although it may not help, do you want, do you have to change your mind? She says, I have changed my mind. And they drove her in an ambulance to the hospital, to the great chagrin of the emergency physicians who says, who brings this dying woman in here, etc., etc. Later that day, she was, she went back home 
uh, the nurse was asked to put on increased number uh, of morphine and she died. And the nurse said to me, I really felt like a hangman, like an executioner. Because that is another aspect of this entire story. Somebody has to do this. Well, three panels, three different perspectives, lots of information, some interesting analysis. And on your behalf, I'd like to thank all of them for their excellent contributions. Thanks also to uh, Rob and Paul for, uh, for organizing this and to all of you for coming and for your questions. And uh, remember, we give an extra cookie to each of our panelists for staying within their time limits. And please feel free to come up and grab some tea or coffee. And I, I'm sure our panelists will hang around for a bit. And if you have other questions or comments you want to make to them, I'm sure they'd be pleased to answer them. So thanks to everybody.